Hello, my name is Dan Hennon. Today is episode number 23 of going over the book, The Gray Stage, written by Greg Fernandez, Jr. Today we'll be joined with Sophia, Catherine, Greg, and Stephen to discuss this case. We are on chapter 11, entitled 21 Questions for Detective Gummert. And what we'll do is we'll go do through the reading of the book, and because uh, Stephen is a former uh, police officer, we're going to get his viewpoints on some of these uh, items first with the Crowley case. He'll have some good insight, I believe. Starting off, on April 19, 2015, I, meaning Greg, sent an email to Apple Valley Police Department's Detective Jim Gummert and requested to speak with him about the case they were building against David Crowley. On April 23rd, Detective Gummert replied to my email, quote, since the case is still being, still considered active by our department, I'm unable to discuss the case or answer any of your questions, end quote. I immediately sent him a response asking if he could speak with me once the case was closed. The following day, Detective Gummert wrote back to me, quote, yes, once the case is no longer active, I would discuss it with you, end quote. Once the investigation was closed, I sent another email to, detective, to the detective on March 16, 2016. Quote, I'm currently writing some articles regarding the David Crowley double murder suicide case, I wrote to the detective. I would love to get some questions answered and police reports slash images clarified if possible. Please let me know if it is possible to schedule a phone call with you or other detectives to be included in the articles. If questions and answers need to be done via email, we can make that work too. Thank you very much for always being responsive to my emails." End quote. Mr. Fernandez, Detective Gummert quickly responded, quote, I appreciate your willingness to include our department's point of view in your upcoming articles, but our department is no longer discussing this case. We believe the time has come to move forward and let our reports available to the public answer any questions people may have. Thank you." End quote. I can respect that, Greg wrote back. However, you did state before that you would answer my questions once the case was closed. I am sorry you have decided to go against your word. God bless." End quote. You are correct, Gummert responded. Quote, I did agree to answer your questions. So with that, please email me your list of questions and I will answer them. Thank you. End quote. Later that night, at 8.30 p.m., I sent the detective 21 questions about their case against David Crowley. On May 10th, 2016, Detective Sergeant Jim Gummert sent me an email with his 21 answers, along with a few concluding comments. Here are the questions and answers in order. So what we'll do is read the questions and the answers. I wanted to ask Stephen, uh, partly, is this a common thing that uh, you would hear from from a, a citizen in the public to answer some questions relating to a case? And if so, would you would you answer them? Would you take the time? Or how common is the, a question, first of all, like that? Yeah, I, I think I think it's a I think it's a hard hard questioning, um, and to take the time to do that um, would would tell me is that it's worth the time for the detective to answer these because there is questions. There are questions. Maybe the detective at that time, whether he's playing which side of the fence, felt maybe it'll help the case, hinder the case. What do these guys have? So it's keep open communications is, is not a bad idea. But it's still an inconvenience to the detective, uh, correct? Well, yeah, oh, sure it is. But look at this case. It's, it's the most serious case in, in, that, that the department's ever had. And then when the case was closed, uh, I, I like how Greg was immediately immediate to send uh, the request back by saying, you know, the case is closed now. Are you free to do that? Mm -hmm. And Gummert wrote back right away, sorry, we're no longer talking about the case. And that's where Greg 
did a good job mm -hmm. in responding right away by backing him in the corner by saying, well, you did promise me that you mm -hmm. would do this. Sure. And he just left it. He just said, sorry, you went against your uh, wishes. So uh, sorry about that. So then now Gummert is placed in a kind of painted himself in a corner. Now we've got to answer the questions. So I think, right. you, I think Greg, you did that well. Oh, absolutely. That, that, took, that took a lot of stones. Thanks. Yeah, it was, it was, um, you know, that I was really frustrated by that because we had been waiting and waiting for, for so long patiently and, you know, and uh, I figured, well, okay, if he's not going to stick to his, to, to his word, that pretty much tells me everything that I need to know. But he proved, he proved me wrong. He did stick to his word and, um, he did, he, he did not limit this to 21 questions, too. That was my fault. I probably, we probably should have had like 101 questions. I don't know. I didn't really know. I've never done anything like, like this. Um, so I had, we had nothing to really go on. I know everybody had questions and we couldn't fit all of those questions in, but we tried to gather, um, as, as many questions. And, you know, really the 21 questions, when we talk about that, it's not, it's not like it's really, you know, 21 questions that I came up with. It's, these are 21 questions that basically the whole Justice for David Crowley and Family group came up with. And what I did is I just picked the top 20, 21 and tried to ask them in a way where if he was under oath, sitting in a courtroom, that he could answer yes or no. And that was, again, some of my fault in, in doing that because um, some of the answers were literally yes or no, and I'm like, ah, I wish he would expand on this. I wish he would expand on that, and we'll get to all of to all of that too. But um, so I really had no idea what to expect from it. But um, to be honest with you, even before I, I had asked him about, you know, um, would he be willing to to talk or anything? I thought he would just pretty much say no, that no, we're not willing to talk, blah, blah, blah. But I think because we did it before the case closed, before he got, this is just a guess, my speculation, before he was told we're not talking about it, because if he was, then obviously um, back in 2015, he would not have said, yeah, sure, you know, I'll, I'll be willing to, to talk to you, you know. So um, that was kind of interesting, the fact that in, in April, He's kind of like, well, the case is still active. I'm unable to discuss your case or any of these questions. And then it's kind of like, yes, he's like, once the case is no longer active, I will discuss it with you. And then in March, six, on March 16th of 2016, it was, or it was, it kind of changed where it's like, no, we're not talking about it now. And so I feel like if I wouldn't have followed up and said, hey, you already said that you would talk about mm. it, my guess is that he may never have even talked about it or anything. So I kind of feel like, the, um, that it wasn't really him saying that we would know, and that's why he says we, but our department is no longer talking talking about it. It was kind of like, um, kind of had the door open there, but uh, that was the only kind of saving grace or else we probably wouldn't even have um, these, these these 21 questions to, to go on. Um, Stephen, as a, as a former officer, I mean, have you ever heard of anything like this? I know you're also a researcher, you are a writer, uh, a bounty hunter, a former bounty hunter, private private eye. Uh, you've also written an awesome book that everybody should go and check out. The Ultimate Prey, the true story of the Yosemite Sightseer murders, and you can order that. You can get it right now on Kindle, $3.99. Uh, get the paperback for $10.89. There's even some used ones if you really, um, if you're really yeah. tight due to COVID and everything. You can see there's a few out there like that, but please. I know, it's crazy, I know. <laughs> buy this new one. Buy the new one right there. Uh, is, is this the only place people can get the book, Stephen? Um, no, there, there's there's probably a 200 platforms. I mean, you can go on to um, Barnes and Noble, go on to Walmart, and buy it. Everybody cares. Everybody cares. Everybody's books if they're electronically uh, okay. um, platforms. Yeah, they they can order it. You know, you can order the hard copy too from Walmart because it's all print on demand. So it's, it's just oh, a I'm push of a button. Yeah, I got to get the hard copy because my my book is filled with with notes and about so much stuff, and we're definitely going to spend some time later on talking more oh, about sure. this, this case because this is such a fascinating case. The way that the book was written, I uh, just reading the book, I was like, this needs to be a feature a feature film. So, um, but I mean, have you ever heard anything? I mean, have you ever had any experiences or heard anything about something like this where there's a case? I, I, you know what? It's uh, with, with the with the twenty one questions. I mean, the, your relationship. You opened up, you know, line of communications. No, have I anything like I have? 
Uh, yeah, in some ways, with the case you're working, you know, I mean, you get somebody, it goes back and forth, like I said. Is it, is, it, is it place guilt on them? No, but, you know, you, they'll give me information, and then they say, we'll talk to you, but we'll shut it down, then we shut it down. And like I said, the case is, is, is still open, that's what you're not going to get anything now is because you, you guys have put a lot of pressure with the right things and a lot of good, good questions they can't answer. Uh, if they close this case, it's enough, you know, freedom of information and versus uh, if it's, a, uh, like I said, it's an ongoing case now, which they don't have, like I said, they don't really have to justify to anybody. The DA, the DA can say it still looks, yeah, let's open this up. we got a question somewhere. They don't have to tell you that question. You know, but you opened that up, Greg, and I think it, it really, I think it really, I think it put them in the corner. I mean, that, that, that's like the opening punch. It's, it's fantastic. Yeah, they didn't, they didn't know what they had, they, they didn't know what they had back then when they answered you. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Or what you had, what you guys have done. They didn't have that information. Things change every day. You know, yeah, it was kind of like a, almost like a bluffing game or something that I felt like we sure. were we were playing because people kept telling us that we had all of these things, and um, I know people were contacting me privately talking about things that I had never heard of, and so it was kind yeah. of like they figured because they got it that we must have it too. And back in this point, that's another great point. There is when I when we wrote these twenty one questions. We didn't, Dan, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think we had anything but the 464 photos and the 94 pages of police reports. I believe that is correct. We just had the photos and the police report, and then we collaborated as a group to get these questions together, and then you you oh. communicated directly with him to get the answers, but it was basically coming from the group. And, and after reading the 94 pages and looking at the photos, we thought in our minds that this, these 21 questions, if he could answer those, would put a lot of things to bed. And, and all we were looking for is just some clarity and, and you know, for him to just answer some of these. And, it, and he did. He answered them all. We got the answers. But we have you know, since learned that it, it opened up way more questions than it did. It didn't really solve anything. Dan, do you know, it was good. It was well done the way, the way it all worked. Um, but it didn't, you know, we didn't sit, get, the, get the answers and say, okay, now we close the book. Now this case is done. We've got the answers, and uh, we can all move on our on our merry way. Right. Yeah, yeah that was that was that was just a, that was just a bad, bad position at that time, and he probably didn't talk to anybody, or you know, his, his lieutenant said, "Yeah, just do this." Or now it's more serious, but that was just meritorial at the time. Now we got a problem. Yeah, and, and it wasn't you know Greg wasn't a family member or had any connection with the case. He was an in, in, yeah. an investigator from California. Yeah. Yeah. Again. You know, I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, he's, he's thing. If great, he, great guy. Yeah, you guys did great. I think if if he was willing to, to talk to me back then, um, I, I was kind of thinking, well, maybe, you know, he'll just, they'll create some type of final report, like we've seen with several other cases. Um, and then ju they would just kind of say, look, this was our actual findings. But to my knowledge, they never put anything out there like that. And um, so this is kind of, this was our one shot at getting something like that for all the hundreds and thousands, possibly millions of people that had questions that still have questions, new people that are just learning about this case. I hope these 21 questions will help them um, to create an informed uh, opinion on this case. And um, uh, we do have Crip Rick. He is joining us here, so I do want to say hi to Rick. Um, Rick, you may not know Stephen Sanzeri, but I think you know just about everybody else. And we were just chatting a little bit about Stephen's book, and I know you're a you love reading, so um, I'm definitely going to send you um, send you a, a couple links to this book. I think you'll really you'll really get it. So it's an it's a murder mystery. I don't know if you've ever heard about the Yosemite sightseer murders, Crip Rick, but if if you haven't, or if you have. Um, this gives you a totally different view from any other thing that I've read on on that case. But just want to say hi to you out there too. Hello, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yes. Ah, perfect. Okay. Hey, sorry. hey, 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 Rick, Steve. Hi. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. I'm sorry I'm late, guys. I was just doing a <laughs> two and a half hour interview, and I I thought for some reason this was happening at midnight tonight. So when Greg told me like he's coming, I'm like, what? So I I really apologize. That's okay. And no, I have not read, heard of those murders, the Yosemite murders, uh, Yosemite murders, or whatever you just said. But I would love to read the book. I think you'll find it fascinating. You'll be fascinated by it. Yeah. Perfect. So I'm here, though. Go ahead, guys. 
Um, all right, um, Sophia, Catherine, any questions, any thoughts before we get rolling on the uh, actual 21 questions here? Sophia, is that happening? No? Oh, Catherine is doing sign language. <laughs> I, well, I thought for sure she was going to say something because it's like she's always so quiet. <laughs> Hi, Sophia. No, I, Hi, Catherine. I don't have any questions. Oh, okay, no. I just wanted to reiterate what um, oh, I can't remember. I think it was Steve. Whichever one person said this about Greg, I'm telling you, you had some severe cojones to sit there and, and follow up with, the, well, you know, you said, you didn't just let it drop. You said you would answer this, and, you know, I'm kind of sorry you just are going to go back on your word. I loved that. You're going to go, oh, you decided to go against your word. Um, again, kudos to you for, for taking that step because when I was reading above going, we believe the time has come to move forward and let our reports answer any questions. It's like, wait, dude, you just told him you're not going to answer anything and now you're, you won't answer anything because it's open mm -hmm. and now you're not going to answer anything because you've moved on. Uh uh, no. So kudos. Yeah, let our reports available to the to the public. That was another teaser. I was like, wait a minute. All right, what let's what how many reports would are not are out there but are not available to the to the public. So that always that was another thing that he was kind of teasing us with. And I wonder if, if that's some of the documents that we've we've been getting over all of these years. And that's why, you know, Dan, without without you creating the Justice for David Crowley and Family Facebook group, man, we would not be here. We would you know, I don't think we would be in a, in a spot where we're getting all of these documents and photos and all of that stuff. So, you know, that's right. a that's that's a big deal. But it's a it's a group effort. It's a team effort, and it's just so nice to have so many people listening to this, watching this. People who are secretly listening and watching, who are encouraging us to keep going forward. It's just so great to see all of that, and so many new people that are coming to this case and just want to know what happened here and so that they can form their own thoughts on it not to just you know hey you're either with us or you're against us like some sith lord or something like that it's just like here's the evidence here is the documents and uh but people i just want to kind of make that ca that that kind of um disclaimer maybe but to just say when when these 21 questions were created this was before we had pretty much every we only had the 464 photos the 94 pages of police reports dan i know you ended up getting another 711 photos from the bca later on i don't know if that was before this or if that was after this either i'm not sure i believe it was after but i think at this point we just had that first round of information and that's why these questions were so important but uh, one thing i'd like to add before we go on is Sergeant Gummert and the Apple Valley Police also knew that whatever we were getting, we were publishing. That's true. Everything was transparent. So now that he's forced to answer these questions on paper, he's got to be sure now that it's, I'm sure he had to get it approved from his superiors and or blessed before it goes out because uh, he knew we were going to slap this all up over the Internet, and we did. So that that... It, you know, we backed. He was kind of backed into a corner, his own corner. But it was, it was. Uh, I'm sure they had to really answer these questions uh, carefully because of other types of repercussions and, and innuendos and people, things people can read into it or not. So they were well aware of us by this time, of course, right? Yeah, that's true. Yeah, we we weren't hiding any anything. It was a public group. It's still a public group. Um, none of that has changed. None of the rules or anything like that has changed. So it's, it was kind of a very open, open forum. And that was, you know, I know people have kind of tried to take advantage of that and tried to, uh, play games and things based on that. But it's, it's always been like that. And that's pretty much the way, you know, the, the, the transparency, um, for this case has always been very important. And we were just hoping that, um, because we were being transparent that the police, the investigators, would also be as tran transparent as possible. Um, so that was the goal. All right, so here's the questions. I will do one at a time along with the question and the answer, and then we can have a little discussion on that as well, or should I do a couple at a time, Greg? I think one. I think one is good. Okay. All right, well, let's, uh, let's start off with the uh, one. Remember, this is a collaborative effort. We put all these together. And Greg uh, slimmed it down to 21 and sent them off. Here's question one. It says, 
What evidence did you find to prove David Crowley was guilty of a double murder suicide? The answer from Gummert was uh, one phrase, Minnesota BCA analysis results. That's it. And that's the 40, is that, that's the 40 page re report that everybody can go and read. Now remember, we didn't have that at the time either, so we couldn't go back and say, wait a minute, we've read the 40 pages and they don't say that. But um, you can find that on my website, thegraystage.wordpress.com. I think Dan also has it on uglytruth.info. I believe that it's also there too, but it's 40 pages. And um, so this is what they say proves David Crowley guilty right here. So but I think the question, Greg, or was it not, is we were expecting to see, you know, five or six bullet points from Gummert to say the uh, the evidence of this, the evidence of X, Y, and Z, the photos of X, Y, and Z, and the uh, laptop that showed X, Y, and Z. Here was what proved him guilty, and his answer was just the BCA analysis results. That's all that he said. Yeah, because the analysis is not evidence. No, it's just, so it's a very vague answer. I think that, you know, once again, he got that approved from up above and uh, to keep things as vague as they could while at the same time answering your questions, Greg, but didn't give us anything. Now, the second question to that is, how long did it take to come to that conclusion? He responds back by saying, it took them several months to send back results. So the answer on question one was basically, nothing from the Apple Valley Police Department. The evidence came from BCA, which is a state agency, and it took them several months to respond. We, you know, our question was directed to you, uh, Gummert, the, the detective leader, the manager of the investigation department, the detectives, you're the sergeant. What evidence did you find to prove? And he said, well, that agency proved it. And how long did it take for you to come to that conclusion? It took them several months. That, that was a non-answer, uh, was it not, Stephen? Oh, uh, it's painted very broadly. I mean, that's for sure. You know, I mean, the first one they answered with the Minnesota BC analysis results is now directs you to their report. It's one more step, you know, and they can do that. You know, I mean, it's like here, here it all is. Now you got a petition for that. You know, they may have to release it, but that's what it is. And it took them several months to send, send back results. You know, how many months did it take? Several? It was several. Is that three or is that nine? You know, so, yeah, that's very, I mean, yeah, it took him, you know, three weeks. So it didn't. He, he That's very broad. Now, the second question starts off with saying several reports state body parts, such as hands, were, quote, missing. Can you clarify as to whether or not body parts were missing from the entire crime scene, question mark? Now, in parentheses, Greg has, according to Detective Bone, Ranny's right, entire right arm and shoulder were missing from her arm socket. David's right hand was missing, and so was most of his skull. A majority of Comel's head was also missing, according to Detective Bone. Both of her hands were found to be missing. His answer was, parts were missing from the scene. Ooh. How much more vague can you get? Does that mean... Parts like they went there and the parts weren't there because obviously the first, you know, one of the early theories when people read this, oh, so they found them, parts were missing, they were taken off of the crime scene, right? You could interpret that one way. Um, well, you guys told, uh, yeah, you might, have, you might have interpreted as rhetorical that you've already answered it for me. You said parts were missing and, you know, right. and, and if it was maybe worded differently. So it's kind of rhetorical. Yeah, parts were missing. You already told. So it's not like, yeah, all oh, those, you know, so, you know, they, he, he might have got you a little on that one. You know, yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, believe me, he he gets he, he gets worse. <laughs> no, but I mean, it's not the answer. But yeah, you see what I'm saying. So yeah, I mean, it's it's such a vague answer that it's like yeah, it's all terrible. Work with that so many different ways. <laughs> Anybody have any thoughts on that? Anything else on that one? Oh, well, we have lots of thoughts on that, that we believe went over all that. We've already gone over this, that part already, but we have all sorts of thoughts, yeah. Uh, ladies or, or Rick, any thoughts? I just have one thing I want to ask. When they say that, hold on here, parts were missing from the scene, maybe Catherine or somebody can answer me this. Did they ever, in any of the reports, because I haven't got through all of them yet, did they ever talk about, like, where these parts were? They Are they assuming the dog ate these parts? Is that what I'm led to believe? 
that's the answer to one of the other questions on down the line. But oh, okay. nothing, right. they were never found. Okay. Rick, uh, if they did find any bone pieces or belongings to the victims that were around their bodies, they were collected in a brown paper bag and put in the body bags with each of the victims. And so they had a brown paper bag for Camille, and they had a brown paper bag for David, but they did not have one for Ronnie. That's weird. So, uh, also, Rick, is a, a great a selfie. They didn't test the dog's feces, did they? No. 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 Right. So the dog, if the dog did this, there would be bone fragments in the feces. Mm-hmm. And that's another problem. So then these missing parts are obviously not what they bagged up. So um, they would have to be, like you said, parts were missing from scene. They were missing the only logical thing, and I, I don't want. I mean, we've already kind of spoiled it. So, pretty much is what they're going to say is that any of the missing parts were due to this to this dog. Is the way that I would interpret it. But just reading this one right. is kind of like, well, why didn't you say that here? You know, parts were yeah. missing, but here's why. I guess maybe I should have had a second question to that, and, and why. Why were parts? No, he answers out. exactly that further on down the line. You'll see. Go yeah. to answer the answer to. <laughs> oh, that's yeah, right. yeah, no, you did. You, you did good, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Question three. The question was: the murder weapon was found near David's left hand. Yet there are many pictures that clearly show David pointing a gun with his right hand. Do you believe David was right-handed or left-handed? The answer from Gummert. Right. And that was a big thing just to kind of clear up anything about, well, maybe David used his left hand for anything. You know, there, what they say right here is that he was he was right-handed. So to me, that pretty much shows, okay, then you have, that's where why we wanted to know where the gun was. We spent so many years trying to figure out where the gun actually landed. Not where they said, you know, I wanted a photo. Just to say, the photo does not lie. The photo will show you exactly where the gun landed, where it was found, and then we can go back and say, okay, how, if David was right-handed, how did the gun get here? How much did the gun weigh? How could it possibly get there? And why didn't police question where the gun was? Because they never questioned the placement of where they found that gun. The weapon, when the weapon is discharged and suicide like that to the head, the gun is going to go backwards away from the head, same opposite direction. It doesn't go forward, it goes backwards. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. yeah. Uh, question four: Were there any latent fingerprints on the blood-smeared wall, where it said "Allahu Akbar"? Gummer's answer was no. Now that was a question that was specifically given to me by a fellow researcher that I was um, kind of privately working. Who probably doesn't want to be mentioned, but that was this person's biggest question here. Um, that's what they wanted to, to know about latent fingerprints. I, at the time, had no idea what latent fingerprints were, but I figured that's a pretty good question. Let's go ahead and, and ask that. So um, if someone wants to kind of explain to people like me, I mean, obviously I know now, but for people who are maybe watching this or listening to this who don't know what latent fingerprints are and how important that would be to prove that David Crowley uh, did write Alu Akbar in blood on the wall. Yeah, and that was a big point back then, too, because the blood was written on the wall, and they uh, assumed that David had did it. So one of our questions were back then is, uh, we want to see his left and his right hand and see if they were covered with blood. Oh, right hand was missing. Left was there, but kind of in a dried-up state. So the next question was, who wrote the writing on the wall? Obviously, the fingerprints would be there. There'd be no reason for David to use uh, gloves or a latex glove or, or anything to hide it as far as who did it. So the question was, was there any fingerprints? The answer is no. Well, does that mean someone used a glove? And if so, more than likely the perpetrator used the glove. David, if he was doing this and going out in a blaze of glory, would have no reason to conceal his identity by writing it. There should be, in my mind, fingerprints all over this wall in the blood that could have been easily lifted and pulled to see who did the writing. Gumbert himself yeah. says, there was none. We couldn't find any fingerprints on that wall, which leads me to believe 
whoever wrote it obviously used uh, latex gloves or some sort of gloves uh, to begin with to do it, and then either took them with and pitched them, and they were no longer uh, at the scene. So someone other than David did do it. Now, we know David's right-handed. His right hand's missing. Um, wh how would you, you know, did he do it with his left hand? Some have suspected that the hand was cut off and used with his own hand. Well, in that case, there would be fingerprints left behind if they used David's cut off hands to dip it into the blood to write it. And even that wasn't there. So that was a leading question by us to say, obviously, Dr. Gum uh, Mr. Gumbert, David, David didn't write on the wall. So that's not evidence. There is no evidence to show that David wrote anything on the wall. So I think that was a good answer. And and that's correct. Question. But we have to we have to keep in mind too that whether it whether or not it we I don't believe it was David, but whether or not if it was David, um, the latent prints are going to be prints that can be captured. And can you find a, like ridge detail and stuff like that? And so basically he's saying no, there's no ridge detail whatsoever. Um, so but we know that something made that. Now is there smeared? DNA or smeared quote unquote prints or whatever down the wall? We don't know because they don't really answer the question. They're just telling you that no, there were no latent prints that left any ridge detail, is basically what he's saying. That so were that wasn't quite the full answer to the question you were asking. Right. And well, was, out of the, go ahead, Sophia. Sorry, Greg. Out of the samples of DNA that they took from the wall, it only came back as Camille's blood. So not even traces of unknown or traces of David's or anything showed in, up in those samples. Right, and, but and the whole thing is with that, and that's that's very true. But we don't know where they took it. Was it a lot of blood in the section they took it from? Would it have been too much of Kamel's blood and not enough of whoever's? Even if it was David's hand that was taken and then written, you know, used to to make those, we don't know. But unfortunately. We don't even get really good close-up photos of the writing on the mm -hmm. wall, which would be great because if we could see a close-up photo, we might have a better understanding of were there yeah. any kind of smears or not. That's true. Hmm. What about the uh, video? Does the video give us... Not close. No, not close. And it's not not the best quality either. Yeah. But it's terrible I did, quality, yeah. I did hear, Greg, that... Somebody was, I, I'm not sure who it, where I saw this or read it, but somebody was saying that the writing on the wall could have been done by the scarf that was by the bodies, uh, like Kamel's scarf. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Yeah, we know yeah. what you're talking about. Yeah. We just don't know. Could it have been? I think at this stage, just about anything could have. Okay. Like, okay. was it a gloved hand? Could it have been a hand wrapped in a scarf? But yet, there seems to be some pretty straightforward lines on that wall. Right. So I That's would I think thought. that a scarf was not used because of just the way the pattern was left. I agree. Yeah, and, and this is, you know, with um, with these 21 questions, anyone that wants to go through it, make sure you cross-reference with the BCA lab re results here. Um, this would be item number 11, and they did item number 12, but for some reason that one is not here for whatever reason. But when they did look for any latent prints, when they did, when they did testing, any blood, D, any DNA blood testing, um, that would be specifically re related to item number 11, item 11, which matches Kamel, does not match David, does not match Rania, would not be expected to occur, occur more than once among unrelated individuals in the world population. So it's a single source DNA that's indicated as female. So, I mean, you could say, well, there's just so much of, of her blood that if there was any other DNA, whoever did it, you know, obviously they it would just kind of over override that. But if anyone other than David did this, I think gloves make, make the best sense. Well, you great, know? great, yeah. great. One, oh, I wanted to say, so one thing you're right, like uh, Catherine had brought up with ridges, but... When blood, blood flow, blood prints, uh, because there's latent prints and what they call plastic prints also, but the latent prints more with toward like uh, the oil of the uh, uh, print to the surface or whatever. When it becomes a still latent print transfer to blood, about t within 12 hours you lose the, you can lose ridges on blood, 
Yes, and I found that interesting because I looked that up just now. So, um, they, so if somebody puts their hand on the wall and tries to draw something, is there a print immediately as soon as they touch the wall? Yeah, there is. But because like a paint or whatever, it doesn't leave the solid latent print like would be oil on glass, which would leave a latent print solid. There's another, there's another substance in between is what I'm saying. Hmm. Yeah, and I thought, yeah, that, that could have been probably, even though they probably did not check it for that, but that's, I mean, it's beside the point in this thing right here with how it was drawn and who did it and whatever. Um, I think that they weren't, they weren't that good to find that anyway, probably, if, if there was. Yeah, and then that just leads back to the thing, okay, then, you know, if, if this is what they're using, if based on what Gummert is telling us, this is where we're going to find the proof right. that Crowley is guilty, then this is what, what we need. In these 40 pages, we should see exactly whatever they're seeing to claim that David mm -hmm. Crowley is guilty. And, of course, sure. you didn't have this at that time, but, you know, looking at it, and it's just like, <laughs> so far, not really seeing it here. No, not at all. Further down, the next question of the 21 is question 5. It says, images of the murder weapon were provided to Tom Lydon, Fox News 9 anchor, who I assume filled out the same disclosures form, the disclosure form as I did. Yet I did not receive the three images that Tom Lydon did, including the image of the murder weapon lying on a living room table, red blood footprints on a hardwood floor, if I file another disclosure request for those specific images, will I receive the images requested? I would also request an image of the murder weapon where it was found. Uh, parentheses, even a censored version. That was the question from Greg, and the answer from Gummert was, fill, uh, fill another one out with a specific request, and I will see what I can do. Mm -hmm. Wow. And Dan, you you got the 700. So again, the, the, we didn't in the 464 photos that we first got. There was no image of of the gun. Period. Um, that showed it on that table or anything really. But um, Dan, when you got the 711 photos, we did get a photo um, of the gun on that table. Yes, yeah, sitting on a uh, sitting on a table, uh, like someone set it there to get a photo of it with the cartridge uh, in, with the cartridge out. Uh, I think both sides of it, the underside, the front side, it looked like it was just sitting there. But we wanted a photo of where was the gun at the scene? Where was the gun lying when officers arrived was, the, I think, what you were asking for there. And they wouldn't give us anything that was uh, graphic in nature. So you were even saying, look, if you need to, you know, scan something out or, or, or censor it or blur it out, uh, that's fine. We still want a photo of the, of the gun where it was found when you arrived <clears throat> on the scene. And that, to this day, has never come up. And all he says here is just fill out another form and we'll see what we can do. Well, I, I think the one photo um, that was on Tony Floyd's website is pretty much, as far as I know, that is the one that where, where the gun was found, um, where they found it. So, uh, so, I mean, we do have it now. We do have that now, but that only came out what since in in August, late August or something like that. So, okay, so pretty recent. So, Greg, you got you, you guys have you guys have evidence the gun was on his left side. Yes, yes, we have a photo that shows where the gun okay. was. Now, now we haven't been able to uh, authenticate that photo yet, as far as I know. Uh -huh. um, I I've asked, and I know Sophia has probably done the exact same thing too. Is we've we've asked. You know, to make sure that because because there was a fake document floating out there, we also wanted to know <laughs> are there fake photos that are floating out there too? Sure. Is this there you go. Real photo? And it's a you know it's a one word answer, so we're still waiting for that answer. But I would love for them to to con for the Apple Valley Police or the Apple Valley City Attorney, whoever needs to make that call, to just confirm the photo that you have seen. Because they looked at at the fake document and they were able to quickly recognize the document was fake. They they they, they, can, they looked at the photo. They can quickly tell is this a real photo or is this not a real photo. It should be pretty pretty clear for them to um, you know tell us yes or no. That's it. You know we're not asking them to do anything more than 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 that. But I haven't heard any answer about that yet. Oh okay. And typically with a, a crime like this, when the media 
the press uh, release and the media gets a hold of it, usually the weapon is like the first thing you see, and now here it's six, six years later is the first time we see the weapon. Right. In its original spot, which I just thought seemed um, yeah, unnatural, I guess. It didn't seem, it didn't seem normal that we have to ask, wait all this time to get to see where the gun was. And they said, oh, here's the gun sitting on a table. We're like, well, yes, we can see the gun sitting on a table, but where was it when you came in? Oh, I don't think a photo exists of that. <laughs> How can that be? Yeah. And and it was, yeah, yeah. we asked this question because Tom Tom Lydon was showing that photo. Like like I said, there were at least three photos that he was showing that we didn't have at that time. So that's all we wanted. If Tom Lydon gets it, we should get it too. That's I think I think that's fair. Right. And even if he would have answered by saying, you know what, there may have been a mistake, you didn't receive them all, you know, but he just said, fill out another form, we'll see what we can do. Yeah. And um, go ahead. Yeah, and I think you did. I know because um, I I never got the seven hundred. I never got the seven hundred and eleven. Of course, you did that with the BCA, so that was a different department. Too, so I don't know if that makes a difference or not. On question number six, it goes on to say, "Is it possible, based on evidence found at the crime scene, Cormel was shot first, and Randy was not immediately shot after?" The answer from Gummert, it is possible. Next question was, Randy's, was Randy's blood or flesh found on Kamel's body? The answer is no. How can that be? If, if the bodies are where they say they are, uh, which they're very cryptic, and not to really say where, you know, where the bodies were found, you know, that, hey, you know, this is where they were um, shot, right? They say, oh, this is where we saw the bodies. They're, they're very cryptic when they say, um, you know, they don't say exactly, okay, David was killed here, Kamel was killed here, Rania was killed here. If, if Rania was killed and landed on Kamel's body, there should be some blood, there should be some flesh, right? There should be something there that mixed. But they say no. So that's another reason why a lot of people thought, okay, Somebody's body was probably moved. Rania's body was probably moved and staged there and staged. So when the police would walk in, they would see this young five-year-old daughter's body on top of her mom's, f furthest away from David, and, hey, it must be David. Staging. All right, question seven. Early media reports suggested Daniel Crowley Jr. went to David's house on December 26th or December 27th, 2014. Mm -hmm. However, in police reports, it is clear Daniel Crowley Jr. stated he was at his brother's house on December 28th. Was Daniel ever asked about his various dates, about the various dates as to when he went to the Crowley's residence? The answer from Gummert is no. Now, Stephen, this may be a good question for, uh, for you as a detective. Uh, if the two dates in the press releases are wrong, or the uh, media reports, and then the official statement was a third date, would that raise suspicion to you as a detective? Um, oh, sure. I mean, it means, uh, but there can always be an answer. This is a typo. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, it, it's, you know, there's always an answer, but, yeah, it would raise suspicion, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, that, that kind of makes, makes you wonder, what else did they not ask Daniel sure. Crowley? What else did they not ask? Because if they're not asking about this, you know, I yeah. mean, like like you said, maybe it's not that big of a deal. You know, he was frazzled, obviously. Um, people, you know, people were probably hounding him, calling him to ask, sure. to, 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 to answer questions. Um, Daniel, and this is Daniel Crowley Jr., you know, um, doesn't really answer much. David's dad doesn't really answer much. I've never heard anything publicly from David's sister, ever. No, 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 no. And I think I think we'll go back. We'll go to that later on with with a goal we talked about. But you know, you you, you can only you can only answer it once for everybody. You know, and the second time is going to get questioned. You know, everybody's answer. Everybody gets a mulligan on the first one. Oh, we made a mistake. Oh, God, we'll do the second one. No, and they're they're on their second life. You know, right. That's how I look at it. You know, so right. yeah, so that'd be the only. So basically what, what Daniel Crowley is saying, Daniel Crowley Jr. is saying, these presents were there from December 28th until the day the bodies were found on January 17th. 
20, 20, 2015. So that's that's a long time, um, obviously. Sure. For a, oh, yeah. uh, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, with a $14,000 check there, if you leave it there, you know, if it's put there on December 28th, it was obviously filled out at least on December 28th, if not earlier, by David's dad. David's dad at some point has to notice the check doesn't clear a couple weeks. Uh, okay, you know, maybe. But we're talking about almost three three weeks here. The check hasn't cleared. Um, so, V, I know you've done more than I have on the phone records. You know, is is David's dad calling calling um, David to check up on this? Hey, I haven't heard from you guys. You know, I mean, is there anything like like that? Is after December twenty eighth or? That kind of stands out to you? Yeah. Uh, there's a couple phone calls from the Crowley Investments or whatever. Mm-hmm. And um, so I'm not exactly sure if that's Dan Crowley Sr. or Dan Jr. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then there is uh, from the mother, too. I don't think I saw anything from the sister. So, or Kamal's family either. Yeah, it seems like the sister communicated more through David's email, but it also seemed like even in November of 2014, um, David wasn't answering her messages, so maybe she had kind of given up way, even way back then. Hard to say. Well, I mean, it would be nice to be able to know for certain and uh, maybe we will find out soon enough. Okay, question have, eight. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. Uh, question, question eight, it says, is it true that police went to the Crowley residence on three separate occasions, once after the bodies were discovered, a second time after a mushroom bullet was discovered, page 51 of the PDF, And a third time on February 18th, 2015, when they found a bullet here hole near the living room ceiling. The answer is yes. Police went three times to the residence. Is that also common, uh, Stephen, from your past work as a detective? Uh, I think three times is pretty light, Dan. I think uh, I'd be spending a lot of time in that place, and I'd be, you know, patrol car outside for a week and a half. I mean, you know, no, more than three times, there's more. they, they, They... I would say they visited more than that, probably. I mean, they swept this thing up pretty quickly. No, I would say, and maybe it's. Oh, really? go ahead. Is it? Is it? Um, is it? I guess I think what Dan is asking, Dan, correct me if I'm wrong, but is it normal to go back three times because you found something? Because somebody has found something new. Oh sure. Oh yeah, no, like, like any, any kind of evidence. Sure, you're going to go back for that. Uh, for that reason, absolutely. Yeah, I mean that's even in this latest case, the Kyle Rittenhouse case. You know, they they missed a couple bullets. Mm-hmm. Or, well, it shows yeah. there, and it's like, wow, how often does this happen? <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. No, no, if somebody calls you and there's it's exculpatory evidence like we spoke about or whatever, that can influence the case, you have to go back. Does that, I mean, is that a thorough investigation when you have to be called back to the home two different times, you know, and, and you know, told about these bullets that if you weren't called back by people that are not in law enforcement, then, you know, you would never even know about these. I mean, I know police. That's a loaded. Uh, that's yeah. a loaded question. But yes, 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 and no. No, absolutely. You know what? I mean, first off, this is a crime scene, and I don't know what you know. They got the cleaners and they do whatever. And like in other cases, we talked about Philip Marshall stuff like that. But then they check. You know, people are still watching and things. You know, um, for, for them to go back in and somebody finds something is, you know, like you said, you know, no way you'd miss an eight foot ceiling that that hole in the ceiling. You just wouldn't. And people that would let back in, I mean, it's, it's a t- you know, yeah, you got to go back in, but you know, there's, we know, we know that they went back in for different purpose. Well, that's, you know? that's, that's the weird thing. Okay. The bodies were found on the 17th. They leave, they're called back two days later for a bullet for one bullet item number 53. You would think at that point, at least they would look up and say, well, oh, sure. Oh, if yeah. A bullet that rolled out of the living room carpet, maybe we should look around and see if there's anything else. But they still miss the bullet uh, the bullet hole right above their head in the living room ceiling. 
on Greg, Greg, just, just I, don't, I don't mean to interrupt you. I get a little excited. I apologize. This, like I said earlier, you know, 10, 10 podcasts ago, this is the sloppiest cover-up murder scene I have ever seen, witnessed, talked about, anything, I, 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 you know, whatever. And, and it was so sloppy. And so there's so much that they think that was so sloppy that everything would be covered up and whitewashed. And it wasn't. You guys are picking out little things and this and that. And they just took it for granted. This thing's a hit. It wasn't, you know, it was it was done by somebody else. David didn't do it. It's, it's, one guy is not this sloppy. And David, you look at him, he's, he's military. This guy's spit polished. He's got a sloppy? Are you kidding me? It would have been three shots himself and clean and no suffering. Exactly. This guy was not a madman that was possessed by Lucifer. Come on. You know what? That's why you guys, what you're doing, and the bullets, they have to start, they have, they've, had, they've had a backtrack. And letting those guys in and all that stuff, we know who was in there. Yeah. It's definitely, you know, uh, it was it was uh, it was a smorgasbord. Stephen, can I ask you a question in regards to the sure. cleaners? Are they mm -hmm. supposed to patch up any bullet holes in the crime scene? So you know what I, I you know I don't know you know I've I, I've never even worked with them those kind of people. Okay. I, I always I always hear about the stories when they come in like in like Men in Black and they sweep the place and and you know erase everybody's brains and uh, it's, I don't know. Um, I know. I know that you know what they got. They have target things in there. They probably track them. Uh, they know what kind of computers they probably. You know, they know what to take right away. And um, who's going to who's going to interrupt them while they're doing that? But the cleaners, uh, you know, and a thing like this cleaners, I don't know. I, I don't know. You know what? Um, and I'm not trying to be prejudiced or anything, but you know, it's if, if they're paying these minimum wages to our people that come over from the border, I'm not going to discuss it. They're not going to look up. They just do their thing, and like any any maid or anybody, you know, I, I don't I don't know who who's the cleaners, you know. Okay. Well, I I was just trying to get some clarification. Yeah, I couldn't have tough call. Something. You know. Well, that, yeah. That that would have been a great thing is is if we ever could get a hold of the the cleaners to say, hey, did did you yeah. see a bullet hole up there? Because <laughs> there were you know several people in that house cleaning. And it'd be interesting to see if any of them saw that, even though the police. Well, you know, you know that, and that goes that goes to the hazard biohazard cleaners, like on that movie, uh, Sunshine Cleaners or whatever. Is mm -hmm. people do that? So, I mean, to sell that house, and you have to disclose in real estate law, somebody, you know, there's a death in the house, that kind of thing. Is that place has to be, you know, just go, gone through top through bottom, bottom to top uh, to be cleaned? Is who did that one? You know, I mean, um, you know, it's a pretty it was a pretty messy scene, you know. Yeah. Well, they completely redid the whole house later later on. Oh, did they? I mean, this oh, this, they did. this was this was another reason why it was um, it didn't make sense that the feds or the DHS would be in involved in this because my feeling is, and I could no. be, just 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 to guess, if they were in the house, they probably would have saw probably would have saw that bullet hole. Um, you know what? I, I mean, the feds be involved. I mean, that we do. You know, we don't know. You know for sure the feds are involved. I mean, that was that thing from what's his name and. You know, I mean, I think they covered this thing up at a pretty low level. Just there's nobody above them that's going to do anything. It's almost, like I said, it's a, it's a whole other step to go around this and get them on the front page. You know, um, I, I don't know. You know, you know, my problem, like I said, is, is Dan, Dan, all you guys' is motive. What's the motive for doing this? Because we know, we know David didn't do this, so what's the motive? A, a, you know, bad script, script you on Hollywood, forty million. But it would, uh, egos, pretty messy for egos. You know, the great stage, all that stuff. Yeah, his, his uh, movie. Sure, I could see. You know, it could be a shadow conspiracy, black ops kind of deal. And they hired some monkeys to do it. Question nine. Was water found in any of the toilets in the Crowley residence? How did the family dog, Paleo, survive for three weeks? The answer, Gumbert says, yes. See answer to question two. That's what I was talking about when you were asking me, Rick, because um, uh, Gumbert is saying that here he's implying, and so we therefore are to infer that it was paleo. He survived by eating the body parts. Oh, okay, I see. Parts missing from scene. 
And so, um, yeah, so I guess, is he implying that, you know, the dog was drinking out of the toilet or, you know, it's kind of, kind of left open, but, um, or did it just, I don't know, can it survive for three weeks without water from those toilets? So there's a lot of things that I think about now that I wish I would have, wish I would have done, you know, wish I would have asked a little dif- differently, but, um, I was, I was hoping they would give me more. I, I felt like the, you know, the, the simpler I kept these questions, the more that mm-hmm. they gave me, and that didn't turn out to be true. Well, yeah, because he's not lying. When, when you're asking the question, was water found in any of the toilets? And he says, yes. I mean, if the lid is down, there's going to be water in there. But he didn't specify as to what condition the water was. Was the was the lid up? Were the lids down? Was one up, one down? He doesn't specify anything. He just says, yes, there was water. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, and I was purposely trying to write these, not, you know, so it didn't seem like I was trying to trick him or anything into any answers. And, you know, uh, so that was kind of, that was my approach on it. Um that you know, I didn't. I wasn't trying to trip him up in, in to, you know, oh, well, you said this, but you know, but this, or whatever. I was trying to make it as simple as 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 possible. So, um, yeah, it's not well, really much there. Um, Stephen, is that how you guys are trained to answer questions? You just answer directly and without explanation, the simplest answer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let me let me let me back let me back let me digress one question and answer very really quickly. A while back, uh, so many podcasts ago, we looked it up what a dog needs to survive for water and all that kind of stuff. And so, uh, the dog, the dog did get water, uh, and did survive. Uh, to answer your question, um, is, say that again. <laughs> uh, I said, are you guys trained to answer questions very succinctly? Yes, no, no explanation, don't expand, um, just keep you, it simple. You know what, um, you know, to a certain point, but you know, I was only a detective for a short time and I didn't have cameras in my faces or a big case like this. And you know what, that would be, that would have been above my pay grade if I was there 10 years. Um, and being a small department and stuff, you know what, you're dealing with a sergeant. I don't, you know, I don't know. I mean, he's handling it to whatever his level. He's being very broad and brief. Um, to, an- to answer for this, I think Greg got a lot of information, and, and I think the I think he, he he got his his goal his mission is because it's turned it into no we don't want to re- release it's turned forward to now it looks like to me like I said we'll talk about is it open case so um, to answer that um, I'm, I'm I'm kind of surprised that Greg got even anything answered he did, you know I mean really it, 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 this is you know and no it's not normal all the time but they respected him enough to answer his questions and they were fair questions. He's basically Greg, saying, we're coming uh, up on 50 minutes. You said to let you know. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so he's basically saying that the uh, dog, um, this is how the dog lived for, for three weeks. So he is verifying the, the three-week theory, and this is it. This is what the dog had. And so it kind of goes back to the, you know, obviously, if I could ask 22 questions, the 22nd question would have been, did you test those dog feces? I did not. I don't know why I didn't include that here, um, but I should have included it. There's a lot that I should have included. Question 10 is Chris Klein, spelled three different ways, last name. Do you know when a neighbor called the Apple Valley Police Department to report a, quote, suspicious person in the Crowley residence on January 19th, 2015? Government response, yes. Yeah, so this is where, it, this was kind of a test question, and um, he kind of did exactly what I hoped he wouldn't do, <laughs> which was just answer, you know, yes. And so it's kind of like, you know, to him it may not be a, a big deal to answer yes, but obviously, you know, these these are very detailed questions. There's a lot here, and so if he's just going to answer yes to me with any of these questions, it's going to tell me um I'm, it's possible that I may in, infer a lot of different things from that, and I and I did. And so at this point, reading this, I was very very frustrated, very frustrated at him, 
frustrated at myself and um uh yeah more more frustrated at myself because of the way that I asked these these questions and um because there was a lot of here that I wanted to know about and obviously pretty much this this may <laughs> anything about January 19th, 2015 20, at that point. And I know we've done a whole show on it later on, but um, I was hoping he would give me something here. Give me a little bit here, you know, okay? You know, but it's like, nope, we're not going to... And we didn't... And Greg, we didn't know the time at this point when you asked this question. Now, later we did get to see that 9-11, report uh, from the police report showing that it was, I think it was 12.50 p.m. or something. But at this point we didn't know. And we know... It, the police were called for a suspicious person on the 19th. We also know the cleaners are there cleaning because they found the bullet on the 19th. But when was the suspicious person? And so I think what we're trying to get at with this question was, was this before the cleaners came? Was it in the middle of the night? Was it after the cleaners left? What time of day? And so your question was, do you know when a neighbor called? And he wrote back, yes. Now later we find out that it was around 1 p.m. just after noon on that day. Um, which is also very strange, but uh, this was, we wanted to get a feel for what all went on the 19th. You know, at eight, nine o'clock that morning, I was creating a justice for Facebook for, for a Crowley page on the 19th. The cleaners were there. The police went there to find that bullet, but they also were there again on the 19th when the suspicious call came in. So they were there twice. A lot went on that day. Yeah, and this this kind of you know this is where it was like okay this it, he, his one word answer tells you so much here about okay the, you know they they don't want to talk about this and so this was a big red flag back then something that I just noted and said okay there must be something very special about this date and there definitely is. Uh, we can do it, Dan, maybe one or two more, and then we can kind of wrap this episode up. If, if you want. Oh, you know, can I say something really quickly, 30 seconds, 20 seconds? Go for it. Go ahead. Uh, real quickly, in that, in that letter, November 1st, 2021, I was reading through it and such, and how they're trying to cover their, their butts and how leaving things open. Right now, you know, basically, you guys got to get a nice open case, not a closed case. So uh, whenever the move, move is made, they have to respond to that. Um, because uh, it's not court case in that um, if something happens, they have to uh, um, answer for it. So I think I think you're in a good position. Hmm. Question 11. The suspicious person was Chris Klein. How was Chris Klein identified as the suspicious person their neighbor was referring to? The answer from Gummert, unknown. Remember, we just, they just got a call that there was a suspicious person. When they got there, no one was there. No vehicle, nothing. So we know now that the suspicious person was Chris Klein. But back then, we were asking Gummert, how did, how did they know who it was? And so he writes, unknown. That, that was a big, always, that's, that's, a, that's a big deal. Yeah, and I, that seems... I don't know. That doesn't seem truthful to me. Doesn't seem like a truthful answer. So if I were to look at any of these questions, anything, you know, I, I, unknown, really? You guys didn't know? Of course you knew. How, how do you find a suspicious person without knowing how to find, how to identify that person? You have to know. Well, now so, I'm really suspicious of Chris Klein because, you know, this is, for some reason, this never even sunk in my head that he was the one who was there on the 19th of January. But yet he's the one in February who makes the call to the detectives and says, oh, you guys missed a hole in the scene. And I know this is just way off topic, but Chris Klein is playing a bigger part here than I realized. Why was in how? If he's there on the 19th, why didn't he notice the bullet hole? And why did it take an entire month for him to all of a sudden now see it? Well, I, I think Klein did notice it on the 19th, um, and it, it was the cops who were trying to connect with him um, from this point. They're, they're the ones that, that called or that left a note for Klein. Klein called, called them back. So, by that, so Klein didn't really contact them until they, they found him. 
basically. I guess. Oh, okay. Okay. So on in February, it was just a matter of playing catch up then. Yeah. It was kind of like, just, okay. Great. Yeah. They Not were, they were like, you. hey, you know, call us. And so then Klein, Klein called them. Yeah. That's, yeah. So they, they had located him, but you're right. Klein didn't offer any of this and say, hey, guys, there's a bullet hole here or anything, you know. But <laughs> Klein, Klein also didn't, didn't know that they didn't know either. Um, there's no way Klein, uh, I mean, there shouldn't have been any way that Klein would know what the police knew and didn't know at that point. If Klein knew that the police didn't know about this until February 18th, then he should have let them know because that would have been something new. Um, but because Klein just started talking about it, when the, when he's talking to these cops, um, it kind of seemed like Klein had also thought that maybe the police did know about it. Reading the 94 pages of police reports, that's the impression that I got, is that Klein was talking about things that he already thought that the cops knew, and the cops are kind of probing him as they're, as this is going on. But it's weird that they're, you know, talking with Klein. They spend a lot of time trying to find who Chris Klein is, but with a lot of these other people that are involved, there's not much mention of it. So what makes Klein so different, so special, if it's not that bullet? Item 57. All right, so 12, last question for the episode today, and this is a good one. Chris Klein stated that he was in the house with Dan Crowley Sr. and Dan Jr., even though the neighbor apparently only reported one, quote, suspicious person. Dan Sr. denied being in the house with Chris Klein. Parentheses, he told me he was not aware of the bullet hole and had not gone into the house with Klein, claims Detective Sean McKnight. So... The question is, do you know if it was ever discovered who was telling the truth and who was not? Gummert's response was no. This may be a question for Stephen also with uh, with his background. Uh, we get more anomalies here, but it's more of a question of follow-up. Is it normal procedure to follow up on these things that don't make sense from a detective's point of view? Or are they just oh, trying to get the most important stuff and not this small, uh, meaningless information? You know what, Dan, good question. You know, a lot of cops are lazy. I hate to say it, you know, so it's, it's what your turnover rocks or not. But the, the thing that bothers me related to that is number 14 of these, you know, Greg asked him about if he saw the hole in the living room uh, ceiling. And he said he saw it, but I don't know the exact date. Either he saw it by himself and logged it, or he was there and he would remember that date. And it was logged when that was found. So it goes, you know, who's telling the truth? I mean, 14 answers, you know, Twelve, you know, I mean, how, how do you don't remember a piece of evidence like a bullet in a homicide? Right. You don't log it. You don't. You don't. You don't remember. I mean, look back. Did Joe Joe Patrolman find it? Okay, you were there. Okay, put that date at least. But don't lie about it. You saw it, but you don't remember the date. Are you shitting me? Oh my God. I mean, really. <laughs> I mean, so sorry to jump ahead, Dan, but twelve equals fourteen. You know. Yeah. <laughs> it does. I'm sorry. It, wow. That was a good question, uh, Greg. Fourteen. But the, but the but the overarching question here is when you're talking to a witness on a case like this, and he was in the house, and he said, "Who are you in the house with?" And he says, "I was in the house with Dan Jr. and Dan Senior." Basically saying, "I was in there with David's brother and his dad." Another right. detective interviews the dad and says, "Were you in the house with Chris Klein and 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 uh, and Dan Jr.?" No, I was ever in the house with. Chris Klein, uh, he basically said, I don't know who, who that even is. I wasn't in the house with him. So the question is, why did Chris Klein say he was in the house with the father, which evidently was never asked? Uh, why would he say that? You know, so now the, father, the story of who's, who's telling the truth and who's not. And I'm saying even regardless of the bullet hole in the ceiling, they can't even get right who was in the house with whom. <laughs> Sure. Oh, no, absolutely. I mean, you know, it, 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 that's why it's such a, you know, a CF uh, cluster is that you got people, bodies in and out. You got this, you got a messy crime scene. Well, why, well who goes into who goes into a house like that afterwards 
a friend, neighbor, family, or whatever. Nobody does. I mean, who was doing, who was trying to cover up what? Somebody, they made a mistake somewhere there. It got too much attention uh, post-murders. And the good thing here, you know, the good thing here is we get Detective Sean McKnight actually doing some follow-up by saying, following up with Dan Sr., were you in the house with Chris Klein? And he says, no, I did not go in the home with Klein. Well, now you get an officer actually doing his job following up. Sure. And it doesn't make sense. And now there's no additional follow-up. Uh, following that rabbit hole or following that trail. Sure. Not saying there's any suspicion involved, but just saying you're still trying to dot your I's and cross your T's, right? Oh, well, these guys are liars anyway. They're murderers. Chris Klein is going to implicate, you know, Dan Sr. because uh, it shows credibility. It shows a rite of passage. Hey, he was in there, whatever. You know, it's my word against his. You know what I mean? I mean, it's, it's kind of like, hey, there's the family's concerned. Hey, this, this backs our play. We're in there. Look at the families in there. What nothing's wrong, you know. And who's lying? Who isn't lying? You know. I don't see the father going there. Yeah, I agree, hundred percent. He said that just to get credit. Yeah, yeah. Sure, absolutely. You know, absolutely. That's like a key to the house. Who's the closest one? The father. Let's get him in there. You know. That's what I'm thinking. I mean, it, you know, and then, and then, and McKnight gets shut down after that. He's, you know, he's onto something maybe. You know? Yeah, and you know, and this is kind of where you know, out of all of the officers uh, on the reports that I've read, I really appreciate um, McKnight um, and well, and Cloconos. Here you've got these two officers who find things, point things out. Why wasn't it followed up? Here, here he is. He's saying, "Okay, I'm showing you that there's a discrepancy here." So you know, kind of throwing you some breadcrumbs, but yet nobody follows up with it. Yeah, that that tells a big answer, I think, right there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, why not follow up on it? It's like, okay, they didn't follow up on uh, Dan Jr.'s, you know, okay, maybe he got the dates wrong or whatever. But, I mean, this is this is something very different. Because they're talking about a bullet that they're going to try to tie to David Crowley, I kind of expected more. Unless they wanted to kind of brush it over, then that would make sense, right? If if we don't ask, then we don't have to worry about getting the wrong answer. So that was my fear, and that's still kind of my fear, is that there were, they didn't ask a lot of questions, they didn't test a lot of things, like item 34, because they didn't want to know what the answers were. They didn't want... They, you know, they were really, and all of this just kind of shows they were just kind of going through the actual motions. And, but I, I think Dan brought up a great point. It kind of, it's like the the detective did follow up on that question. He didn't have to follow up on it, but he he did. So that's another thing. Well, why, you know, there's certain things that they do follow up on, other things that they really don't, other things that they brush over, and. It just, it's a CF, like you said, Stephen, it's a question. <laughs> and it's almost like every time that when they follow up on something and then they find out that, you know, that's going to actually either prove a point they were trying to make wrong or it's going to lead down another rabbit hole, they just walk away. Okay, yeah, leave exactly. it. You know what, but, but the, now, now that they're shutting everything down, because I think it, it is considered an open case, everybody's going to be blocked from everything until lawsuits filed in, in, in Apple Valley now, like I said, on the above the fold in the local paper. And, you know, people love dirty police corruption stories, man. They get a lot of attention. Well, do do, uh, do we want to get some uh, final thoughts from everybody and then um, kind of shut this one down? So, me and Rick have been real quiet, so they should get a chance. To <laughs> I'm just, yeah, well, I'm well, just I'm, listening. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. Rick is probably taking all all of of this in. I know Rick has um, spoken with us, and he's kind of um, just kind of uh, researching this and looking into it. So, uh, Rick, what are your first impressions of what you've heard today? Um, my first impress my first impressions of this whole case is that it 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 just doesn't make sense. I don't know what however I don't know how to other to put it. It's just I don't understand what like when I'm reading and I'm doing what everybody recommended me to do. Everybody's telling me to go read everything myself, look at the reports myself, so that's exactly what I'm doing. And I just don't understand 
this investigation at all. Like things that should have been tested were never tested. Um, there's samples that they have of blood that's from other places of the house and never tested. They never did any um, like the string test to try to figure out where the bullets came from, like the directions and all of that. And it's just every time I keep reading more and more into these files, I just keep getting more and more questions. It's just it's crazy. Yeah. That's my thought where I am. I'm just trying to figure it all out and I just I'm not getting I'm getting answers in some things and getting tons of questions on the other on the awesome. other end. It's crazy. Yeah. Uh Sophia, what do you think about these uh what twelve questions that we've gone through so far? Oh, well, uh I mean there's frustrating because he doesn't give very clear answers. It's just like, yes, no. <laughs> Refer back to exactly. question number two, you know, and it's like, okay. Uh, I mean, I'm glad you guys did this. This was before I came to the group. So I am glad that you were able to get the questions asked. It's just, I don't know. I mean, were you trying to make it simple for him to answer? Or I, I'm just wondering why these questions were phrased like this. And I don't know. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we, we were trying, I was trying to make it simple so that he could answer or not answer, trying to gauge not only his, his answers, but to gauge how well he would answer those questions. And so I think people can make their own judgment on that. I have my own. Um, mm -hmm. fr my <laughs> very frustrated, basically, with the answers that I, that I got. And, um, you know, like I said, there's a lot of things that I wish that, that I would have done or would have um, asked, um, maybe not limit it to just 20, 21. But, yeah, there was a lot of the frustration. But the my personal thing was to make it so that he could answer yes or no. So anytime that he answers yes or no and I'm still wanting more, I take that as my fault in the way that I ask the question or the way that I phrase the question. Maybe I should have broke down those questions to kind of... Um, but I also didn't want to um, try to trip him up or, you know, it, it, I also knew at that point that they didn't want to answer any questions, so I didn't want to get, well, we can't answer that question. Um, so I, you know, I did try to kind of make it like if he was on a witness stand and all they have to do is answer yes or answer no. And so that was kind of the goal. And I, I think a lot of that we, I, I did fail and I did fail with a lot of the things. I think we asked the right questions, maybe not in the, in the best way. And, um, but I was kind of hoping, hoping against hope kind of to just say, well, maybe he'll throw in a little more. And at the very end, which I know we'll cover in a future show, um, he gives his reasoning for why he answers a lot of this yes and no. So stay tuned for that, or you can read read the book and learn more. <laughs> Do you think that if we sent maybe 10 questions to Apple Valley now, that they might answer them? Not requesting any paperwork or anything like that, but just you know. you're saying maybe you but but we put together ten questions off these questions well, yes, I mean, like ten questions that we have after reading everything now that we have more information oh we well, oh sure oh oh, listen, pretend this is a court, and I go back to after Dan at number fourteen i love i love this listen first off, stones, I'm the guy that said it to Greg. Uh, you, you don't even go backwards and apologize for anything. you got more information than anybody could have. And 14, here it is, number 14, Greg Fernandez, Jr. Did you see the bullet hole in the living room ceiling on January 17, 2015? <laughs> Gummer, I saw it, unknown of exact date. Now, listen, before you answer that, you might thumb through the file of the case and see where Joe Detective saw the bullet from the maid who saw this and Mr. Mustard, whatever it was, and the, and the broomstick. <laughs> and you, can, you know what? It's not really difficult to, 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 to 
uh, that, that, a, uh, that a very important piece of evidence, such as a bullet in a murder scene, is not going to be logged with the date and time, okay? So it doesn't take a lot of effort to, get, to answer that uh, and either confirm it was that date or no, it was three hours later and I was on the shitter, okay? All right, it doesn't matter. My point is... That really, uh, really, I mean, if I, I would, I mean, I wish I was Rittenhouse's defense attorney. They're doing a great job, and I love the judge. But yeah. you know what? There's a point where sensibility and logic, you know what, good old horse sense, I mean, yeah, I don't care what the law is, man. You know what? I mean, wow. You know, um, but 14, is that what, I mean, that answer, because I'm not jumping ahead, because that's the last where we stopped, but. No, that's, that's, um, a, that's a great teaser for next month's episode, actually. So. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, I mean, come on, that, that, you know, that, and that's the thing. Uh, and like, I, there's a case in San Diego. Like I told Greg, where it would get, they found a gal hung, but her, her hands were tied behind her back over a two-story balcony in an apartment complex. How do you tie your hands behind your back and then jump off? And all the departments covered it up, and, and then, including a kid I worked with, John Froman, I love dearly. He's the chief of Coronado, just retired. Uh, it was his, it was his, in his backyard, and. Uh, P.I. got involved and said this is, this is a homicide and now they got to open it's a big mess so I mean I don't understand why, why law enforcement you know what there's too many smart people out there like you guys and there's plenty of information access to your fingertips on the internet and throw half of it out and the rest is good I mean you know what they make a lot of cases done like this I mean uh, you know like you got you got great information ahead of time you're not going to see much now and uh, I, I just said I have an idea how to get it so a great job, great, great job, guys, today. Thank you, Stephen. Sure. Um, Catherine. Um, I I don't have anything to add that everybody else hasn't already said, but I. I <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm, <laughs> no, it's it's great. I mean, you guys have covered all the bases, but I will say that the next one, like Stephen keeps bringing up that one question. I I think our entire show is going to be on that one question because we all want to see about it. <laughs> I mean, that, a yes and no is, 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 you know, is an answer. I mean, you know, heading north isn't a plan, it's a direction, okay? So um, is this here, you know, <laughs> that's the same thing here. I saw an unknown exact date. I, that, wow, you know, I mean, this is where, this is where, I mean, attorney, this is where the attorney gets involved for whomever hires that attorney. And you know what? They'll tear this thing apart. Really. Well, and here's the whole thing. He wasn't lying. It's not a lie. No. <laughs> And no, so that, he not. didn't answer your question, but he didn't lie. So. <laughs> I, I don't, I don't recollect. You know what? It's, it's probably what if you got him on the witness stand, probably what he would say, right? I mean, that's on. No, the he, 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 no, he, he, he would re-answer it after he got his notes. He's just oh, saying exactly. basically is that uh, unknown, unknown ex exact date. He's just saying is that you know what? Ask me again. You know, you know, it's like. It's like I don't recollect. Oh, you know. Right. Exactly. I was just gonna say. It's just, it's, I can't. Yeah. I mean, it's like. No, F I, yeah. I mean, it's, it's asinine. It's asinine. Yeah, you know. I mean, yeah. To say that that you don't know, like what day that you saw it. Yeah, that's yeah, that's a big. That's a pretty big deal. I would say. Yes. Yeah, so why didn't you answer? You know, you had, you had access to that date. Why did you? Why are you playing games? You know, if you you know, it's not like Man, you know when you still. Answer. Yeah, I mean, we we sent these questions off, and he had a lot oh, sure. of time to think about it, to get it approved by the higher ups and everything. So we went through all of that, and and again, the main thing for me was to be honest, um, to think, okay, if I was in his spot, what type of questions would I want, you know, asked or, or answered, or you know, I I don't want trick questions. I never wanted to try to trick him up because I wouldn't want somebody to ask me those questions, which, which people have. They purposely will ask you questions so they can get a sound bite or so they can kind of just take part of your answer or take your answer out of context. So, exactly. Um, You're right. You know, the, the, the main thing for me was to make sure that because he's willing to even ask, to even answer these questions, he doesn't have to answer these questions. He doesn't have to, he doesn't owe us any. He doesn't owe me anything. He doesn't. Yeah, but yeah, but you know, yeah, but the point is, look at what you did and now they're back in the corner and they've, they've left the case uh, open for additional homicide suspects, and that's what they're saying. I read all the stuff, and that's what they're saying. Now they don't can't give you any information because you, you're so close, you're probably going to make this case, and they know that. They, like I said, they don't have to give the public a reason why they all said it's not a cold case, and now we think we might have something. Hey, just your pressure alone. I mean, that, that, this is, listen, this is the best thing you ever did. They, they, they made a move. 
they, 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 this is an open homicide investigation. It wasn't, if it, when you guys started this thing, it was pretty much in the cabinet. Come on. I mean, look at, I mean, you gotta look, I'm, I'm looking at that way, guys. And maybe it's good I haven't been around for a while because I've kind of, I keep up with Greg and we talk, but I'm able to come back in and see the progress. Yeah, and you know, Greg, you keep kind of um, like almost apologizing for your questions. Don't they were? Yeah, right exactly. Don't. And here's the thing. Yeah, Greg, come on, man. Greg, man up, Greg, man up. Yeah. You did so fucking good, man. <laughs> I mean, they were great questions, but the reality yeah. is, is he? Yeah. Asked, and he answered. He didn't yes. lie. However, you were kind of hoping that maybe he would expand, but. They don't. It's kind of like you, you ask them like it would be in a court of law, and in a court of law, you don't expand. You answer yes or no. End of story. Yeah, simple. So, yeah, that's it. I think it exactly. was great. Even by his yes or no answers, we, yeah. we have a better understanding. Thanks to you. Yeah, absolutely. God, yeah, don't apologize. Yeah, we, you got it nailed, man. It's, it's Yeah, like I said, this is, now, this is now an open investigation. Ooh, exculpatory evidence. Anything to change in saying fix whatever with the case they have to accept you know you just hold it back don't give don't give anything yet but you have to start taking stuff it's an open case you're you know your your citizen has a right to give to give witness statements and evidence that you believe might have something to do with the case yeah you got all that you got all that loaded loaded in your uh, you know your on your bandero um yeah i i do want to finish up uh, i'm going to do a little screen share because i've been talking Good. to Crip Rick about this and um, I do think that this, because Crip Rick does, um, and Rick, I want you to plug your channel too, because um, uh, I know you do, um, you know, you've been doing a lot of great work there. And when I think about guests, and I know you're always looking for some great guests, Stephen Sanzeri would be an awesome guest for you, brother. Can you help uh, me set this up? Yeah, I'm pretty sure we can. I'm, um, I want you, I'm going to bring on Steve, Stephen. Can you kind of um, let people know about your book? I, I want to hear some of the background. Um, I have so many notes, Stephen, so many questions about this, but I think um, Crip Rick, um, you know, he's been, he's just started his, his channel, just started um, doing this, and he's done an awesome job. And I just look at what he's done and I know you would be a great guest on, on, on his show. So if you can kind of let us know a little bit about your book and everything, and then that will give Rick kind of a little background about it. Oh, no, thanks, Greg. And Chris, Rick, welcome. You know, I, I, I've kind of caught on what you're doing too, and we're doing a good, good thing, you know? Thank you. Um, so thank you. No, yeah, thank you. It, no, it was, uh, you know, I'm a former police officer out of the Bay area. And I became a bail bondsman. And you, do, you know, you do your own bounties. And I, I bailed this guy out of Swalney County, California. And it was right when the uh, 1999 Yosemite murders, uh, Sightseer murders, occurred on Valentine's weekend. And so uh, I bailed this guy out, and he jumps on me and starts chasing this guy. And it, you know, the FBI can't find the girls, and then they find a murder a month later, and one another one murdered a month later after that. And so I chased this guy all around the country to Alabama, and I arrested him. And it shows it's about the FBI, how they tried to, you know, have me stop my case and everything. And it, this guy became the number one manhunt in Alabama. And in, that was just the beginning. Uh, and so I worked with the family to try to prove there was others involved. There wasn't one person. So that's what it's about. But it has a backstory about five years earlier, I was indicted as a bounty hunter and looking up state prison. And it was set up and we proved it. And so I, it was my second time with the biggest murder case in the nation. And so that's what happened, you know, and I'm proud to say I told Greg, I can't name it, uh, Rick, but we, I just shot a, um, a three, three, uh, three part documentary. Now I'm not all of it about, uh, the Yosemite case. And we did some shooting Yosemite in Modesto two months ago. And so I wanted to, maybe one of the three platforms coming up and probably in January. So the, the book kind of led to a documentary and it's about, uh, first one about one guy, one guy, Kerry Stainer didn't do it alone. So. There's a question with that, so it's, a, it's an interesting story. Oh, for sure. I'd say I would love to get you on as a guest to talk about this. Sure. Yeah, and you know, it goes also, you know, just so you know, Rick, look up um, Mark, Mark Archuleta and, and National Coalition for Men and his murder up there in Mariposa just recently, uh, and he just had a case, and it was a conservatorship, and, and Ronnie, or Jerry, Jerry Cox was just on Dr. Phil. Mariposa has been a very corrupt uh, county and it goes all the way up to the White House. And then there's in, in law and uh, when Hillary Clinton was with Rose's Law Group, 
how it led to Mariposa with the Contras and a lot of the first cocaine in the 70s and early 80s was distributed out of Yosemite Park. Um, there's, wow. a, there's a big history up there. Yeah, so I didn't already go into that there, Rick. It leads into before that. And when the Queen, Queen of England was up there and, and three circuit, Secret Service guys were killed, uh, and, and Mariposa was involved in that. And, um, yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff on that. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Um, uh, oh, yeah, uh, real quickly, great video on YouTube. Type in Mariposa corruption and look at this video for 20 minutes. Uh, 2020 went in there. And, um, Tom Gerald and Hugh Downs and everybody did a special about it and how it's all controlled with drugs and everything. And that's on YouTube. All right. And what's it called on YouTube again? I'm bringing it up right now. It, 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 type in, uh, type in, Mar type in, uh, Mariposa corruption and you'll see, uh, Probably see a, a, a thumbnail and it says Keddy Lodge or something on there. You'll see yep. a guy, kind of a heavy set guy in a blue shirt. That's 20 minute video and 2020 went in there when they found all this out, how corrupted it was. And that's what led to my case and the Yosemite case. And it's still going on and they murdered this attorney. By the way, Mark Archuleta was killed in press view, right? At his home when he answered the door, a guy gunned him down. A week later is when the uh, son of Judge Salas was murdered in New Jersey when Salas just took the Epstein accounting uh, part of, of, of the uh, mediation. So he said it was the same. And then he found him dead in his cabin up there from suicide. So it was the same shooter in a UPS on the train that went back and killed Judge Salas. His son wounded the husband. She wasn't there. So that's how Mariposa is related. And that's a fact. They say it was the same guy. Why did Mark actually let it get killed the day after it was going to, day before it was going to be a, um, a, a hearing? So it's a big I'll, deal. I'll it's pretty heavy. Watch. I'm going to definitely watch this. Yeah, check it out. But anyway, I don't, I don't mean to rant for you, but it gives you a lot of information. No, not a problem at all. I, I really look forward to getting you on my show and discussing this. Sure. And I'm to read the book and stuff. I think it'll be an amazing interview. Oh, well, thank you. I, anytime, you know, just give me a day's notice or so. For, yep, for sure. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that too. Um there's so much so much there. Um so I guess we can go ahead and shut this one down for now. I feel like there was something else I wanted to mention. Uh oh, Rick, um let us know where people can find your oh, channel. Okay. And yeah, you can just yeah. find me on YouTube. Uh just look under Crypt Rick's I've been thinking. And cool. if you bring up that page, <laughs> you will definitely uh, find me. And it's basically, that's it's all in the title. Stuff I think about. Right on. Doing a lot of interviews. I'm doing stuff on cryptocurrency. Uh, oh, yeah? Teaching people all about crypto, yeah, right from the from its origins. Cool. And we're kind of building it up slowly cool. to build cool. it up. Doing some interviews with Greg and Catherine and yeah. a couple other people. Cool. And really cool site. You'll really enjoy it. It's a great site, guys. Oh, yeah, sounds good. Oh, Greg's got it up. There you go. You're on the ball there today, Greg. There it is, right there. Yep. <laughs> and and I, I know you have a lot of stuff coming out, too. Um, oh, for sure. In, and you're working on a podcast? Are you working on getting the podcast going again? or? Well, yeah, I, I'm trying to. I'm going to have to talk to you about I want to start uploading up to my Anchor account like you do. So I just need help from you to teach me how to do that. But oh, I, I definitely want to start doing that again and doing my anchor podcast that I used to do. Okay. And there is episode number 23, 21 questions for Detective Gummert, part one. There will be a part two coming out on New Year's Day. So New Year's Day will be the next podcast, the official podcast of the Gray Stage podcast series. Remember, every month, on the first of every month, we will premiere a brand new episode related to the David Crowley case, discussing my book, The Gray Stage, by Greg Fernandez Jr. So I do hope that you have enjoyed that, that you've been watching, listening, you can always catch up on multiple episodes wherever you're listening, wherever you're watching, you will be able to find it. So wherever you listen to your podcast, no doubt you will find it right there. Uh, wherever you watch um, streams on YouTube or Rumble, you'll find them both. Um, on, if you just look up The Gray Stage, you will find it on YouTube and you will find it on Rumble. So with that in mind... 
Um, you can always just go directly to my website, thegraystage.wordpress.com, and find everything right there. Now, not only can you find the book, the free book, if you just go right here, go to thegraystage.wordpress.com, click on where it says read the book right under the title, and that will take you to where you can download the free PDF book by just clicking on this image right here and within a couple seconds you have the book right there that you can download. Now you can also purchase this book too. If you scroll down just a little bit more you will be able to purchase a physical copy and hopefully by next year we will have this book for worldwide distribution. Currently you can only get it on lulu.com if you want the physical paperback book. Now once it drops to worldwide distribution, this price at lulu.com will be lowered. So um, that will be kind of the, the trade-off here. I'll probably lower it down to $15 perhaps. Um, and there's always deals go to lulu.com. We just missed one. There was just one deal that was 30% off. So you could have gotten this book for 30% off. And I'm sure around Christmas time um, that will be available there, there's always some type of codes discount so I will try to do better um, at posting those discounts for anyone that does want to purchase a physical copy and I do believe um, directly from here you can purchase it no matter what country you're in I know I've looked it up before and uh, so if you want to have a physical purchase to add to your collection that is awesome if you would like an autographed copy and maybe a couple little bonus gifts too you can always email me at thegraystage at gmail.com and we can discuss that as well um, usually with shipping because a lot i'm getting a lot of uh, people who want it from out of state so 25 bucks will cover the cost and will cover the shipping cost which for some reason is a lot more so I don't know with the worldwide distribution maybe that'll be a, lot, a little easier for people uh, across this great planet who want to purchase a physical copy but I would say before you purchase a physical copy check it out read the um, you know just download it and maybe you won't need it you know like I said you can always print this thing out too so um, but if you want the physical copy, it is definitely there. But I wanted to make sure that this book is just for research purposes. So um, that's why I wanted to make sure everybody could have the PDF free. So you have access to that right now. The 21 questions for Detective Gummert in the latest version of this book, starting at page 107 in the PDF. And we got to 12 questions so we still have a part two and i'm pretty sure we can get to the rest of those in the next episode perhaps we'll see maybe we'll end up doing three uh podcast episodes on this but this was um released today on december 1st 2021 and of course dan hennen um, starts us off by reading out all these questions here and going through um, at least 12 of these questions and then we had a great panel great awesome panel we had Catherine Sophia we had Steven Sanzeri and we have a new member we have Crip Rick who joined us for the very first time for this podcast and so it was great to have his view and um, I think he and Steven are going to do something in the near future and look out for maybe a bonus episode unrelated to this case that I may be putting out. I don't know if I'll put it out on this channel. I may put it out on my Greg Fernandez Jr. channel and my Greg Fernandez Jr. podcast, the What is Truth podcast, but we will make sure to put um, some of the extras that was taken out. This episode went about 90 minutes and we do try to keep it to one hour. As Catherine always says, we always go over it's almost impossible i think sophia would also agree with that it's almost impossible to just stick to 90 minutes but we try that's our goal uh, is to stick to 60 minutes and we've done it a couple times um but not every time so just wanted to throw that out there but this was great we went through all of these questions and we even teased uh steven sanziri gave a little teaser about um question number 14 so once we get there in our next episode which will come out on uh, January 1st of 2022. So we'll talk more about everything starting at question number 13 and down. And hopefully we'll be able to get through all of these questions and then kind of get through the end of the chapter. But you don't have to wait. You can 
download the book right now and you don't have to wait for to hear our views on it. You can just read it for, for yourself and decide what you think about this chapter, about this book. I love to get feedback too, so uh, always looking for feedback. I try to converse with everybody at least once if I can. And, um, you know, beyond that, depending on where the conversation goes, um, we'll either limit our conversations or we will expand on those things so uh thankfully we've had more expansions than deletions quote unquote blocks so not too many blocks most of the people are very respectful that comment that can contribute uh even the even some people that disagree about david crowley you know i've had some great conversations with people who also believe david crowley did this and we've discussed different things different aspects and you know if you read the back of my book and you still believe david crowley is is guilty um there's not much more that i can do you know i've, I've tried i tried my best to kind of show you why i believe he is innocent so when you purchase this book um you can kind of see some of that stuff here you know it just talks about all the things that the the uh, the authorities could not do that they could not prove and um that's been a part of a couple of short videos that i've made we also have a new short video series that is coming out here soon uh, i've only gotten one episode done this is just just called david crowley David Crowley number one covers David Crowley's gun. It keeps it very specific to what is in the police reports and to what is in the DNA results, which is what conveniently I also put in this book as well. So um, that will be a new series. It's starting up. We only have one episode out. Uh, the next one will be on the bullets and the bullet casings. And then we'll do one about the missing DNA because there is at least two unknown DNA sources found in the Crowley home. And that deserves its own show. Also, William Rail has done... If you haven't followed William Rail on Twitch, please do. Um, his Twitch channel is Strange Investigations. So if you go to Twitch and put in Strange Investigations, William Rail, it'll probably be the first thing that pops up. He's been doing some great episodes lately um, on, the, on, the, on the timeline. He's put together a massive amount of work just on the timeline so that everybody can see what the timeline is and that includes the phone records so while i was kind of contemplating doing a show on the missing dna i was watching william's twitch channel and he was doing a show um, that pointed out a lot of the unknown phone records so we have unknown dna we have unknown phone callers and um hopefully we'll be able to get into that and maybe do a do a little brief show on that but the david crowley series is what i'm calling it and those will hopefully be short episodes no longer than six seven minutes you know hopefully we can keep it to that for new researchers that just need a video glance to get caught up on different aspects of this case so that will be what we will cover very soon now regarding everybody who has contributed um, to the show and all of our listeners, I want to again thank you all. Um, if you are not subscribed to Catherine's channel, please make sure that you do. Just type in her name, Catherine, M I C H E L E, only one L. And um, her YouTube is also I'm Asking Questions, which is um, pretty cool because it's very similar to our newest podcast um, panelist, <laughs> Crip Rick, who has. Uh, a channel that is called uh, Crip Rips. I've been thinking, and so one is asking questions, one is thinking, and that's what we need to to do in this case to uh, hopefully get the case reopened. I think that's still the the, the goal here. Uh, getting justice for the David Crowley and family has been, you know, that's the goal of the Justice for David Crowley and Family Facebook group here, and that goal has not changed. It stays the same. So you can see the group will be used to investigate the odd circumstances surrounding the deaths of David Crowley, his wife, and daughter. So that's the purpose of this group here. Um, so Crip Rick has been doing some great interviews. Check out his latest one with Sophia. And Sophia... Hopefully she'll get a YouTube channel, get some social media uh, platform where she can share more of her views. But just listening to this, which was awesome because I loved hearing 
um, Sophia's views on this because it is a little bit different. Somehow, Crip Rick has been able to find a way to make my interview about the case, Catherine's interview about the case, and Sophia's interview about the case different. So there is multiple um, stories, different content that you'll find just by watching all three of these, which you can always find on Crip Rick's YouTube channel. Just type in Crip Rick, C-R-Y-P-T-R-I-C-K, and put in I've Been Thinking. It should pop right up right up so hope you enjoy that he's also got some other um some other episodes and a lot of future episodes so stay tuned for that so make sure that you subscribe to his channel to Catherine's channel and once sophia gets a channel you want to subscribe there too don't forget about dan hinnon the man who started all of this here um if you go to uglytruth.info his website is still up and uh, he's also now on Rumble as well, so make sure that you check him out on his new Rumble channel. He's going to be uploading past videos. Uh, I'm going to try to pull some videos that I have, and maybe we can upload, have him upload those there too. And um, once we get into the big data dump that I have from my main channel, um, maybe we'll even start posting some more stuff um, as a new channel for Dan Hinnon um, to YouTube. So make sure that you stay tuned for that he's been doing some great work just on a lot of different things he has his own radio show so make sure that you also check that out on eternal affairs radio and you can find that wherever you listen to any podcasts and you can see he's been doing a lot of great things about the human trafficking the southern border um he's just got so many great things coming up here so make sure that you check out um dan dan hannon's podcast uh, wherever you listen to podcasts, you will be able to find it. And he just is knocking that stuff out there. So the most recent one that just came out, We Are the News Now with Dan Hinnon on EA Truth Radio with Jack Dorsey. Omicron, you want to hear about that. Jelaine, Jelaine, Gisling, Maxwell, I know I'm pronouncing that wrong. Gavin Newsom and more. So make sure that you check him out because he's been doing some great stuff on Kyle Rittenhouse and a lot of other great topics. So... Whatever you are looking for, go to uglytruth.info and click on the radio show link and listen to his to his podcast. I think you'll be very impressed with that. Um, another person who joined us again was Stephen San Sanziri. So he was also with us and that was great to have him uh, a part of this podcast too. So um, Stephen has been doing some great work and a lot of good things coming up. But if you go to Amazon, put in Ultimate Prey, Stephen Sanziri, it will pop right up. You can get the Kindle version. Um, you can get the free book there. I'm sorry, get the paperback book there. So make sure that you do that. Get one or the other. I got the paperback and I just really enjoy it. And I think Crip Rick is going to have Stephen Sanziri on very soon. I'm sure you all caught that at the end of this episode. And like I said, we'll have a bonus um, episode unrelated to this, talking about wrestling, talking about Steven Sanziri's time, um, owning a gold gym as a police officer, bounty hunter, all that great stuff. He has a lot of stories that we have not even touched on yet, so we'll probably be adding that. Um, I may add that here to this podcast just for people who want to know more, dig a little bit deeper into Steven Sanziri and some of his past exploits and things that he's done in the past so once so we do have the justice for david crowley and family facebook group i hope you all can join that and we also have the gray stage page so you can get some of the latest things before anybody else um, sees them i try to post um, try to post a lot of stuff there first so um, you can always go to the gray stage that is a page on facebook and you can follow that but if you're looking for anything, for any documents related to the David Crowley case, just go to thegraystage.wordpress.com and more than likely you'll find them all here. Um, we do have the latest articles that we've done too. So you can see that on the fake police document, David's day one journal, the paranormal phone recordings, which I still have not made into a YouTube version yet. But if you've listened to this podcast, hopefully you've listened to that. Now that was recorded before we got the day one journal. So there's obviously a few more things that should be added into that particular podcast or into that YouTube show once it's put out. If you're looking for David Crowley scripts, you can find those there too. Um, and we also have the podcast. So if you click on the link to the Gray Stage podcast, 
what I do is I've compiled everything. So as we have new podcasts, all the podcasts will be added here. We will add the audio version, the video version, all of the bonus episodes, and the archives will all be added here in one great place. So you can always make sure that you catch this stuff and catch our podcast. And this is a great way to make sure that you're going to the right place, especially with the YouTube. Um, you can always catch it. And we, we have... Um, uh, every every month again every new episode and we're just reading through my book basically and tasking Dan Hinnett with reading through the book but you can always get it right there and um, so save this um, subscribe to this website I guess and make sure that you uh, whenever I post anything new but every month just come back in here and check because there will be whatever the latest episode will always be added into this section here so just wanted to throw that out as well and then if you keep scrolling and scrolling and scrolling down you will find all of the documents and you can see that I have not done a good job at kind of putting them into some type of order into the category so that is in the works for now just kind of scroll down and you can find just about every document that we have on this case that is related to this case photos videos whatever you're looking for you will find it here if you're looking for the dna results that's been a big one the one you want to download is the bca lab analysis that is going to um, give you the 40 pages uh, of the dna results and the firearms results and all the other results basically they're lab results so <laughs> lots of great stuff that you will find there just depending on what you're looking for to further your research and um we have the 911 call, David's military records, things about guns, a search warrant, property evidence, their Equifax records, phone records, um, their email, David's contract. If you have not read David's Hollywood contract, it is right there. Um, the lawyer bill for that, the lawyer correspondence, which is pretty weird and interesting. I'll leave it at that. Um, the documents David wanted Danny Mason to sign are also here on my website and the email exchanges back and forth between them. David Crowley was, um, he auditioned to be, or wanted to audition, filled out the paperwork to be on a show called The Doomsday Prepper Season 3. So um, he did audition for that, so you can read that if you're looking for his notebook, if you're looking for Kamel's last text messages, David's mom's obituary, at least what, what we have. Um, all of that stuff can all be found right here on my website, and as we get more documents, they will also be added there as well. So just want to throw that out to everybody. I want to say God bless you all. Thank you all for taking the time to listen and to watch this podcast every month on the first of every month. And until next time, I'll see you.